F.A. Hayek is one of the best known thinkers of the Austrian School of Economics. His book, The Road to Serfdom, is a classic that is on the shelf of nearly every economist and economic student alike. That seminal text is the focus of this video. The book originally was dedicated to, quote, socialists of all parties, end quote, meaning that both the right and left could be pulled away from the free market and towards planning, not just the left. Hayek was a liberal in the classical sense, not in the way that you may think of in America today. In fact, both the Democratic and Republican parties would be considered liberal, and most countries in the world today are liberal as well. Though Hayek is sometimes called a conservative by the left, he vehemently rejected this term, saying, quote, conservatism, though a necessary element in any stable society, is not a social program. It is often closer to socialism than true liberalism, and with its traditionalistic, anti-intellectual, and often mystical propensities, it will never, except in short periods of disillusionment, appeal to the young or all those others who believe that some changes are desirable if the world is to become a better place. A conservative movement, by its very nature, is bound to be a defender of established privileges and to lean on the power of government for the protection of privilege. The essence of the liberal position, however, is the denial of all privilege if privilege is understood in its proper and original meaning of the state granting and protecting rights to some which are not available on equal terms to others." End quote. To Hayek, liberalism really centers around the free market, individualism, and the disillusionment of hierarchy so that each individual can choose a path for his own life as he sees fit. This trend really kicked off in the Renaissance and has blossomed ever since. Hayek says that liberalism is so successful that it can actually be self-destructive because it is so good at generating wealth that it naturally creates inequalities, which creates discontent. Unfortunately, we have unlimited wants and finite resources, which is problematic for any economic system. To make matters worse, we constantly compare our lives to others, so we become dissatisfied with what we currently have rather than looking at how much our lives have improved over the generations. This can actually erode liberalism as we seek swift responses to minor problems and transgressions. Socialists pretend to have solutions to all of our problems and claim that socialism and democracy go hand in hand, but already in the time of Alexis de Tocqueville, it could be seen that democracy and socialism were incompatible. Tocqueville said, democracy extends the sphere of individual freedom, socialism restricts it. Democracy attaches all possible value to each man, socialism makes each man a mere agent, a mere number. Democracy and socialism have nothing in common but one word, equality. But notice the difference. While democracy seeks equality and liberty, socialism seeks equality in restraint and servitude. End quote. Unfortunately, it is common that when attempts are made at democratic socialism, it turns into something so much the opposite that the so-called socialists don't even recognize themselves in the mirror any longer. Freedom itself has been so corrupted that it needed to be completely redefined. Quoting Hayek, quote, To the great apostles of political freedom, the word had meant freedom from coercion, freedom from the arbitrary power of other men, release from the ties which left the individual no choice but obedience to the orders of a superior to whom he was attached. The new freedom promised, however, was the freedom from necessity, released from the compulsion of the circumstances which inevitably limit the range of choice for all of us, although for some very much more than others. Freedom in this sense is, of course, merely another name for power or wealth." End quote. He also gives us the definition of socialism, stating, quote, socialism means the abolition of private enterprise or private ownership of the means of production and the creation of a system of planned economy in which the entrepreneur working for profit is replaced by a central planning body, end quote. And he believes that socialism is significantly worse than the free market, quote, because it is necessary in the first instance that the parties in the market should be free to sell and buy at any price at which they can find a partner to the transaction, and that anybody should be free to produce, sell, and buy anything that may be produced or sold at all. And it is essential 
that the entry into the different trades should be open to all on equal terms, and that the law should not tolerate any attempts by individuals or groups to restrict this entry by open or concealed force. Any attempt to control prices or quantities of particular commodities deprives competition of its power of bringing about an effective coordination of individual efforts, because price changes then cease to register all the relevant changes and circumstances, and no longer provide a reliable guide for the individual's actions." End quote. Surprisingly, he does not believe that all government intervention is created equal, though, saying, This is not necessarily true, however, of measures merely restricting the allowed methods of production, so long as the restrictions affect all potential producers equally, and are not used as an indirect way of controlling prices and quantities. Though all such controls of the methods or production impose extra costs, i.e. make it necessary to use more resources to produce a given output, they may be well worthwhile. To prohibit the use of certain poisonous substances or to require special precaution in their use, to limit working hours or to require certain sanitary arrangements is fully compatible with the preservation of competition." End quote. A prerequisite to a good economy is a good legal system that preserves competition protects private property, and allows freedom of contract. Things like patents can actually lead to the destruction of competition and can therefore be destructive to the market. The legal system needs to be somewhat malleable so that it can be applied to the changes in the market, but it cannot, obviously, foresee everything. He goes on to list some examples of where the government can be useful. Quote, there are finally undoubted fields where no legal arrangements can create the main condition on which the usefulness of the system of competition and private property demands, namely, that the owner benefits from all the useful services rendered by his property, and suffers for all the damages caused by others where, for example, it is impracticable to make the enjoyment of certain services dependent on the payment of a price. Competition will not produce the services, and the price system becomes similarly ineffective when the damage caused to others by certain use of property cannot be effectively charged to the owner of that property. He then gives another example, quote, Thus neither the provision of signposts on the roads, nor in most circumstances that of the roads themselves, can be paid for by every individual user, nor can certain harmful effects of deforestation, or of some methods of farming, or of the smoke and noise of factories, be confined to the owner of the property in question or to those who are willing to submit to the damage for an agreed compensation. In such instances, we must find some substitute for the regulation by the price mechanism. But the fact that we have to resort to the substitution of direct regulation by authority where the conditions for the proper working of competition cannot be created does not prove that we should suppress competition where it can be made to function." End quote. He next justifies when the state can use force. Quote, of course, every state must act, and every action of the state interferes with something or other. But that is not the point. The important question is whether the individual can foresee the actions of the state and make use of this knowledge as a datum in forming his own plans, with the result that the state cannot control the use made of its machinery, and that the individual knows precisely how far he will be protected against interference from others, or whether the state is in the position to frustrate individual efforts." End quote. Hayek refutes the idea that monopolies will form everywhere, and all small-scale sellers will be priced out of the market. He quotes a study saying, quote, The superior efficiency of large establishments has not been demonstrated. The advantages that are supposed to destroy competition have failed to manifest themselves in the fields, nor do the economies of size where they exist invariably necessitate monopoly. The size or the sizes of the optimum Efficiency may be reached long before the major part of the supply is subjected to such control. The conclusions that the advantage of large-scale production must lead inevitably to the abolition of competition cannot be accepted. It should be noted, moreover, the monopoly is frequently the product of factors other than the lower costs of greater size. It is attained through collusive agreement and promoted by public policies. When these agreements are invalidated, and when these policies are reversed, competitive conditions can be restored." End quote. He is explicitly anti-collectivist, saying that communists and fascists may have some different beliefs, but they both want to organize society at the expense of the individual. He also fears that when people act on behalf of a group, it seems 
to free them from moral restraints. Democracy is no stranger to this mentality, and we should never think of it as a perfect system. He says, quote, we have no intention, however, of making a fetish of democracy. It may well be true that our generation talks and thinks too much of democracy and too little of the values which it serves. It cannot be said of democracy, as Lord Acton truly said of liberty, that it's not a means to a higher political end. It is itself the highest political end. It is not for the sake of a good public administration that it is required, but for the security in the pursuit of the highest objects of civil society and of private life. Democracy is essentially a means, a utilitarian device for safeguarding internal peace and individual freedom. As such, it is by no means infallible or certain, nor must we forget that there have often been much more cultural and spiritual freedom under an autocratic rule than under some democracies. And it is at least conceivable that under the government of a very homogeneous and doctrinaire majority, democratic government might be as oppressive as the worst dictatorships. Our point, however, is not that dictatorship must inevitably extirpate freedom, but rather that planning leads to dictatorship, because dictatorship is the most effective instrument of coercion and the enforcement of ideals, and is such essential if central planning on a large scale is to be possible." End quote. In summary, we all yearn for some security, but it must not come at the heavy cost of our liberty. We must use the market forces to increase our freedom and only use the government when it is absolutely necessary and fits with the rule of law. Some governments will be more competent than others, but no government is competent enough to plan an entire economy. Thanks.